Welcome back to the Inside Story with RLLC. This last week of October, we have a special episode for you as it's the final week of Dyslexia Awareness Month. Instead of hearing from me and a guest, today you will get to absorb knowledge from the owners of RLLC, Susan Denker and Carla Askew. They will be answering some frequently asked questions that parents have when their child is diagnosed with dyslexia. Now I'll turn it over to Susan and Carla to share their expert knowledge with you all. Hi, I'm Susan Danker, and I'm one of the owners of the Reading and Language Learning Center. In May 2002, Carla Askew and I created the Reading and Language Learning Center with a specific focus on dyslexia. As speech-language pathologists, we saw that the clients we were treating for articulation and language disorders were beginning to have difficulty with reading. We wanted to be able to help them reach their true potential. So in today's podcast, Carla and I are going to discuss some of the most frequent questions that we get from parents. So let's go ahead and get started. How are you doing today, Carla? I'm great. I'm excited to get this started. Fantastic. So Carla, this is one of the questions that we always get from parents. Usually it's the first question that they ask us when they're thinking about starting therapy at RLLC. What do you think this question is going to be? Hmm. How How long long will this take? How long will this take? That's what they all want to know. So what would you tell them, Carla? So first of all, parents often think that there's a quick fix to dyslexia. Dyslexia is lifelong. It changes as your child grows. Every child is different. And it's important to remember that dyslexia is a continuum. We initially start with 60 hours of intensive therapy, which is daily. Once they are finished with the 60 hours, then we make recommendations based on their progress. This may mean that they need to continue one time per week or two to three times per week um, for a year. And then we assess again after that year to determine what their needs are. So we as therapists are always monitoring their progress to make these decisions. Yeah, I often tell parents that I don't have a magic wand, but I wish I did because that would be fantastic if I could just wave that wand and their child would be in and out. But like you said, every child is different, but those are the pretty much the basics of what the standard is for treating the children with dyslexia. And I think it's important to note also, Susan, that often parents go to tutors or centers and they tend to get therapy, um, what we call dribble therapy. So Mm -hmm. one to two times per week, and it just doesn't work. It just does not work with dyslexia. That's right. It's so important that it's done frequently and intensively and with fidelity. Correct. Um, Another question that parents ask are what programs at school will coordinate with what RLLC is teaching? What would you tell a parent that's asking you something like that? Right. So our program, Sounds to Print, was developed by Susan and I and incorporates many of the elements of the OG approach. Our program, Sounds to Print, the OG approach in Wilson are direct, explicit, multi-sensory programs that are presented in a systematic way. These approaches are all science-based and are most effective ways to address dyslexia. What does not work are the whole language approaches, Fontas and Pinnell, leveled literacy, reading recovery, and reading mastery. Those do not work for children with dyslexia. Great. Thanks for sharing that. And then parents often want to know what books they can read with their child or what they can do at home to help them. So allow your child to choose books that they are interested in. So you may find that it's way above their reading level. That's okay. Choose an audible book or take turns with them when reading in the evening. Listening to a story is just as important as reading a story. You want to continue to develop their love of books as well as their language skills. What could they do at home with some of the preschool or kindergarten age students to help them get some of those early phonemic awareness 
um, activities done. Yeah, so at home, you can practice sound identification. This can be an I spy game where they have to find objects that start with the B sound. Or after you read a book, go back through the book and identify pictures that start with the B sound. You can also practice blending of simple words such as cat. So you would say the sounds k, at, and ask them what the word is. And you could do this with bag, lip. You could look for things around the kitchen to do. Or even when you're in the car driving, you can have them sound out um, things they see. Great. Now, Susan, I have a few questions for you. All right, go ahead. So why can't we work on writing or spelling right away? Why do we get that question? Yeah, we get that question a lot. Um, Sometimes it comes from the middle school and high school parents. Um, They'll tell us, no, he just, he can read. He's reading just fine. He's reading on grade level, according to the school. He just, it's his writing. It's his spelling. He can't spell words when he's writing. So we have to take a step back and look um, at where the child actually is functioning. And oftentimes what we find out is that they don't have the foundational skills um, solidified yet, even though they're in middle school or high school. And in order to spell, children need to have the foundational skills. So they need to be able to segment sounds. They need to be able to know which letter sounds corresponds um, when they're spelling. And then if they hear a word, they have to be able to pull apart that word or segment each sound and then know which sound goes with that. If you're not able to segment or you don't have a strong letter sound correspondence, you're not gonna be able to spell. And if they have difficulty holding on to sounds, um, this is also going to impact their ability to spell. So a lot of these children also have a diagnosis of um, poor working memory. That's something that comes up a lot, whether it's from the school um, report or from an outside, a private psychology evaluation, and that working memory really impacts that ability to hold the sounds long enough in memory to write them down. Okay. So why are working memory drills important in the clinic? So working memory drills are crucial when a child has difficulty holding on to sounds. For instance, if a child is attempting to decode a word such as green, they may say each sound, but when they try and blend it together, they may only remember the last two sounds. So they may say each sound correctly, g, er, e, Mm, but when they try and blend that, they just remember een. So they're not able to hold on to the first two sounds. And this becomes more problematic as there's more syllables in words. And again, that working memory piece is not only going to have an impact on the word level, but also in reading. If they're decoding or sounding out each word as they read, they may not remember when asked to read a sentence back fluently. Um, when spelling, they may also not be able to hold on to each sound as they work through of spelling that word. So we might see very kind of like phonetic spelling if a child is trying to do, for example, like everyone, they might put E, V, R, Y, O, N, E. That's something very common we might see. So they know that there's letters that should be in there, but they're not solid enough to know all of the sounds or to know that that ER needs to be in there. And I think it's important to note that that working memory piece really impacts their reading comprehension. Mm -hmm. So when they're struggling to decode and read fluently, Um, recalling that information that's important, like those key details or what the main idea is of the paragraph or making inferences, it makes it very difficult for them. Absolutely. And also um, math, holding on to those multiplication tables, addition, subtraction, parents might also see it there with the working memory. And I think with that piece, it's really important not to have that. um, They always like to time them Mm -hmm. when they're doing multiplication facts or addition facts. And we need to take that timer away and allow them to process and understand the concept versus just spitting it out so quickly. 
Absolutely. Those timers can make such a difference in a negative way for a child with dyslexia. And you may see them shut down once you pull that timer out. It's just too much. It's overwhelming. Yeah. They become like a deer in a headlight. Yes. Okay. So often parents ask, should my child take a foreign language? And foreign language is required in high school, right? So what should I do? Mm -hmm. So the answer is maybe. Um, Many kids with dyslexia find it difficult to learn a foreign language, and unfortunately, most school districts don't offer foreign language instruction tailored to children with dyslexia, which can be very problematic. Um, So when I say maybe, here's some reasons why. Um, So foreign languages are, they can be great. It's very empowering for a child to learn another language. Um, With all kids, it can be a great way to even tap into a cultural background. Um, And foreign languages can convey concepts that don't exist in the English language. Um, But when parents ask, okay, well, we're going to take the language, which one should I take? Should we do French or Spanish? And the best answer is, it's important to follow your child's interest, because the language they ultimately choose will make a big difference in how well they do. Because we know ourselves, if we're not interested in something, we're not going to put our full effort in. So kids can be fascinated by French. And if that's what's happening for your child, and they're going to be more motivated to work on that. But if the child doesn't have a particular preference um, and they're just doing it so they get that credit for high school, Spanish would be the better choice for a child with dyslexia. And the reason being is that it's more predictable of the languages. It has fewer rules and fewer exceptions. And it shares a lot of the same root words as English. And in fact, Spanish, a little bit easier to learn because there's only five vowel sounds to learn. Great. Um, And often I'll recommend to my parents that they take in high school, they take the language courses the first two years um, Mm -hmm. and get those out of the way when their load isn't as heavy. And also, you know, it's usually the seventh semester of high school that colleges are starting to look at their GPAs. Mm -hmm. That's right. Okay. So what about children with autism? Mm -hmm. I often see or hear from parents, well, he reads so well. He's not dyslexic or she's not dyslexic. She's reading on grade level. Why is it that my child can read at grade level but needs intervention? Mm -hmm. Yeah, a lot of children with autism um, are perceived to read at grade level, um, but they actually can't spell. And the thing is, dyslexia is a it's a common learning difference, and it's going to impact the reading, and it makes it hard to isolate the sounds and words and to match those sounds, to blend those sounds, um, to form the words that they're reading. So children with autism often read based on visual memory. They, many times they are hyperlexic and hyperlexia is when a child can read at levels far beyond those expected for their age. So hyper means better than, and lexia means reading or language. A child with hyperlexia might figure out or memorize word patterns, but they do not know how to actually decode or sound out the words very quickly. Additionally, they often do not understand what they're reading. So while they might, the parent might say, yep, he's reading all of these history books and is fascinated with World War II, but the child may be looking at the words, um, but not getting any content out of what they're reading. They're just looking at the words that they've memorized, maybe skipping over words or changing words based on visual structure. So we often see with the children in particular with autism that they seemingly can read real words, but when we give them a nonsense word, they're not able to decode them or break them apart because they actually don't have that sound and symbol relationship. So it's back to the basics for that. And then we can work on the spelling once those skills are solidified. So are you saying that they also need those foundational skills in order to be successful? 
Absolutely. Yeah. Even our um, high school students or college students that come to us or adults, we have to incorporate a piece of phonemic awareness. It is so critical. You have to have phonemic awareness in order to be a reader. So um, Carla, let me ask you a couple of questions. We, um, we often get parents asking us if they should do vision therapy and will vision therapy help cure dyslexia or help make the dyslexia less for their child? What would you tell a parent that asks you that question? Um, actually, Susan, studies have shown that vision therapy does not successfully treat dyslexia. We need to remember that dyslexia is a language-based learning disability. Vision therapy uses eye exercises to treat vision problems that can affect reading and learning, such as convergence and sufficiency. Vision therapy is not the same as traditional treatment to correct problems like farsightedness. Mm -hmm. So vision therapy is not going to help your child decode those words. Right. And like you said, parents have to remember that dyslexia is language based. Mm -hmm. So yes. important. And then um, accommodations for school. Parents often ask us to come to attend IEP meetings or to look over the IEP, um, especially the accommodations or the goals that have been set for their child. What would you tell a parent in particular for a child that has dyslexia? What would be some great accommodations for them? So some great accommodations for the school day, for standardized testing, would be to have extended time to complete assignments or tests. Um, so in even breaking up the time, so allowing them to come in and do the testing for 30 minutes and then go off to do something else and come back later is a good option. Um, they should have flexible seating. They should be a seated seated close to the teacher where they can see the teacher's face, they can see the teacher's mouth, um, which is really important when it comes to those spelling tests, right? Mm -hmm. um, also, they should have um, instructions read aloud to them. So to ensure that they understand what they're supposed to do, movement breaks are great. You know, maybe they take down, they take the attendance to the office, run an errand for the teacher, but allowing them to get out of their seats for a bit can make a big difference. As far as spelling accommodations, we want to focus in on maybe one pattern, one vowel pattern when we're doing the spelling. Um, a good thing is to work on those spelling words with their therapist. So getting that information ahead of time really will help your child um, determine what patterns are in that spelling list because often schools give a spelling test and there aren't, they're not all the same. And what I mean by that is they're not all focusing on say the AI like in rain or grain, it might be a variety of A spellings within there. So it's important that the therapist break that down for the student so that they know what they should be focused on during the spelling test. Right, because otherwise it's just forcing memorization and that's what we want to get them away from, right? Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, also, a foreign language waiver is possible. Um, you can always ask for that if your child truly is not going to do well in that language course that they have to take two years of. That is an option. Mm -hmm. I was just thinking um, also having taking the tests in a small group in a quiet environment could be so helpful, especially for the children that also have ADHD along mm -hmm. with dyslexia so that they don't get that, feel that pressure of looking around the room and the other kids are finished and turning in their test and they're still making their way through. Right. Exactly. And then also what about like study guides in advance ahead of quizzes or tests? Would that be helpful to a child with dyslexia? That would definitely be helpful. It gives them an opportunity to prepare earlier. 
Um, remember we talked about that working memory piece. Right. So if it can be introduced earlier and in, and reviewed in different ways, then they'll have more success. Great. Well, thanks for chatting with me today, Carla. This has been a lot of fun and I hope that we've um, shared some great insight with the parents and our other listeners. I hope so too. This was fun. We'll have to do it again. Great. See you later. Bye.